Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Whether you're a first-time investor or you started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow, 2022 REB Buyers Agent of the Year and Rising Star finalist Lachlan Vidler and his team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take your next step in growing your portfolio. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment property. Visit atlaspropertygroup.com.au to book in your discovery call absolutely free of charge. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day you are listening. Grace Ormsby here with a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. Super exciting. It's an interesting period, I think. We've just heard from the Reserve Bank of Australia what's happening with interest rates for May. We're looking down the lens at a Pretty tightly contested federal election come the end of this month. Inflation is up through the roof. There's so much going on and a lot of you probably listening from home, the gym, wherever you are, have probably noticed a little bit of a difference in the amount of properties being advertised at the moment. We have seen that we've entered a pretty different market at this point in time of May 2022, but someone who's going to talk us through that today and I think will be a great person to be getting insight from at this point in time is the founder and director of the Sarama Group. Matt Sarama, welcome to the show. It's not the first time you've been been on, but we're just as glad to have you back. No, I really appreciate it. I love getting the call up to come on the show with you guys. And it's my debut with you, Grace. I've been an avid listener. Uh, It's great to uh, change up the host and chat to you today. Yeah, no feel today. You're stuck with me, but it will be a great episode. We're we're going to be talking through some pretty topical and timely things, Matt. And I'm pretty excited because um, you've got some tips that you're going to be giving us a little bit later in the episode. But before we do get to that, interest rates, hot topic of the month at the moment. They've just gone up more than a lot of people were expecting as well. We've got the full 0.25% increase. A lot of people have said it had to be done. What are your thoughts on what's going on with interest rates at the moment? You've got a few properties yourself. You're in the property market, in the industry too. So you've probably got not a unique perspective, but a really, you know, strongly grounded one. Yeah. No, it's uh, I'm always a big believer, Grace. Like people always believe what they see, read and hear. So me as a human being, I'm always cautious of what I'm absorbing and that's just not from a property point of view, like I was a former professional athlete and uh, I feel to get to the top at any field of life, you know, you need to stay very narrow focused and focused on your goals and really educate yourself. So I took the same principles from my professional sporting background into the business world. And same thing, like there's always noise with whatever you do in life. It's, it's us as humans. What do we choose to listen to? I believe. So I love personally, I know this is probably the investor coming out of me, but I, I've never been more excited because it's been as a buyer's agent in my personal life, uh, in my business life, sorry, and an investor in my personal life. These are the sorts of markets as a buyer I I love. So one thing I always say to people out there is always just be protective on what you see, read and hear because at the end of the day, you've got to remember news outlets, media outlets, they're all designed to get you to listen and click and, and all those sorts of things. So Anything that's topical at the moment, they'll obviously magnify it. So um, it's an interesting time. So the main thing is just getting educated around it. So happy to chat a little bit further around the interest rates period because, yeah, of course, it's definitely on the rise up. Sentiment. Like you sound so positive, Matt, but I don't think that that's what, you know, the general property buyer is feeling at the moment. Can you talk us through what, you're seeing from your perspective out there in the market, not necessarily, let's take you away from it and that positive mindset, but but what are general, you know, buyers off the street thinking about the current property market and the landscape that we're currently living in economic wise? Yeah, the general buyers thinking it's doom and gloom. So it's, uh, you know, and, and one thing I always say, like, if you want to be in the top 
one percent of of whatever it is in life or in the top five percent you need to be thinking differently to the the 95 percent so i feel the 95 percent of society at the moment are probably a glass half empty sort of approach where it's a little bit of doom and gloom obviously different sentiment and pullback i'm noticing definitely on the ground at open homes less numbers so when you compare it to six months ago it was like a nightclub line to get in now Sometimes I'm the only one there at auctions. Uh, it's generally only me and maybe one other registered bidder, or even just me and the auctioneer going at it. So it's definitely, definitely changed, and it's just showing that buyer sentiment is down. But what I'm finding is working with like the sort of top one percent of, of investors as well, and and also uh, the way I see things as well is this is the time where would you rather buy in competition or in isolation so that's a really big one i i I guess try to educate a lot of buyers is to have that frame of mind where it's would you rather buy in competition or in isolation so we're in a period now where interest rates are going up buyers are pulling back agents are really struggling to offload listings as well is a big one i'm finding hence why we can chat around as we, we said off air around off markets as well it's a very, very interesting time and, and sentiment's playing a big part of it. So one thing I'm always saying is, yeah, the education piece is around look at what the interest rates are doing and, and see how it affects you from a household disposable income point of view. That's a really good place to start, I feel, Grace. Yeah, that, that's some good thoughts there and we're going to come back to that. But, Matt, I do have to say I have a picture in my head right now of you and an auctioneer just standing across from each <laughs> other and, and just shouting, you know, offers that might or might not be accepted. So I don't think auctions is really where it's at at the moment then. And and you would probably agree given you have been looking around the off-market side of things. But you did mention that agents are running into some trouble with their listings. Before we quite get to that, that buyer sentiment, I I wouldn't mind asking if if you've seen that filtering through to vendor expectations yet. You know, are, are they at a point yet where they, they've realised that we're operating in a completely different market or are they still holding on to some hope? Awesome. I love how you brought that up, Grace. One thing I can give a tip to buyers out there is to gauge on the ground what the buyer and vendor gap is doing. So when we seen last year, I call, I call it like chasing the tail, right? Last year, there were a lot of buyers chasing the tail. What I meant is it was in an upswing market buyers out there were chasing the tail you know they were, they were comparing things three or six months prior on purchase price and saying oh it's not worth that or and they just kept missing out because they couldn't quantify value they were missing they were just chasing the tail of the market now what i feel will happen over the next six to twelve is vendors are going to start chasing the tail down so what i mean by that is buyers are now saying no i'm staying put at this purchase price I'm, they're quantifying value the vendors need some help. They, they're still thinking they're on that upward trend and upward swing. And I've noticed, and this is why some deals are, are, are getting done at good prices because that gap is so big. The agents are struggling and obviously agents want to get deals done. So they're trying their best to educate vendors that, hey, we're not moving at that pace we were last year. It's kind of leveling out. But some vendors, given the circumstance, when that turns the swing, you know, and then and it could be three months, six months, their house is still sitting on the market. They probably should have taken an offer that they got presented, you know, prior, if that makes sense. Or now mm. they're chasing it downwards. So I always try to help buyers out by thinking of chasing the tower. Who's chasing the tower? And at the moment, last few months, it's always been the buyer, the last 12 to 18 months. I feel move forward sort of six to 12 months. Don't be surprised if the vendors are chasing the tower down. Which does put property investors in a really good position by the sounds of it, especially when you think about that uneven power dynamic that does exist in a transaction. You know, the real estate agent is working for the vendor. They're never actually working for the buyer. So those conversations should probably already be happening, I'm guessing, between vendors and agents. And and if those deals are struggling to happen, then it sounds like buyers are in a pretty good position going forward. 100%. And one thing, I can educate people on the inside, like being on the ground is 
look, I, I chat to agents constantly as well. And the good agents are the ones who have them upfront conversations with vendors and educate them around the market. The agents who are less experienced, who have been in a market circa, you know, 2022, where it was just Just good times. Just yeah, good, good times, yeah. Like, stick a sign out the front and get a record price. They're really going to struggle in these next markets because what I'm noticing already is we've been picking up absolute cracking deals. And even in my personal life, just through the fact of exploiting the agent, not being able to manage vendor expectations, and also around property sitting on the market. You've got to remember, Grace, agents have a 90-day lease, uh, an agreement with vendors to sell a property. Mm -hmm. One tip I can give buyers is keep an eye on property because at the start of a campaign, it could be grossly overpriced. And, you know, the agents probably did that to win the listing or maybe the vendors just weren't educated thoroughly enough. And generally, if the motivation is strong enough, you'll notice after sort of one week, three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, obviously that listing loses traction on realestate.com and domain. No people are, are turning up to the open home. Obviously, sentiment's down already with interest rates and whatnot. And you could imagine how an agent's feeling at day 60. Uh, he's only got, he or she's only got 30 days left to sell it. Otherwise, they've done all this work for free. Perfect time to pounce on a deal. So don't, just be... I'm trying to educate people, look at the whole market, look at what the agents are doing, look at what the vendor's expectation is doing, and then look at what the buyers are doing as well. So you've got to look at it all from a game plan. I know that's a bit of a sport analogy, but it's like a, you've got to have a bit of a game plan going into a market like this, and that's how you come up with one top 1% results, I feel. I imagine, Matt, that that's the most well, the least used feature on those property portals, which is simply you know sorting those results by the ones that have been on the site for the longest, but that button is there. People can be looking at how long listings have been on there. I want to get now into some of those off-market deals and the properties, but we're going to take a quick break first. We'll be back soon with more from Matt Sarama. Ever wondered how you can invest like the top 1% of Australian property investors? Henderson Advocacy has been at the forefront of helping everyday Aussies improve their financial freedom. So if you're a savvy investor or someone just starting out on their property journey, give Henderson Advocacy a call today. Head to www.henderson.com.au. Don't invest alone. Invest smarter. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm joined by the founder and director of the Sarama Group, Matt Sarama. Matt, just before the break, we alluded to off-market deals and it's probably a pretty good time, May 2022, to be looking into these. There's a lot of things that are, I guess, making the market quite different to what it has been for the last 12 to 18 months and the rate rises, the recent rate rise and the promise of more still to come and then the federal election. A lot of things impacting buyer sentiment negatively. But from your perspective, it's still a great time to be buying and getting yourself on the property ladder. Off-market property seems like a pretty popular, well, not popular because not many people have been doing that or relying on that recently, but you think it's the way to go for, for property investors who are in the know at the moment? Well, one thing I just heard you say that their grace is around, around the center. I guess the, the best time to buy is when you can comfortably afford it. So what I always try to help people with is, look, do your numbers and do your buffers. Take into account interest rate rises and, and do your buffers because the educated buyer does all them before you've been going out to buy. It's called sharpening the saw. I always say before you even go out to cut, you've got to have a sharp saw. So don't go into the market uneducated and be like the 95% of people. Be in the top 5% and sharpen your saw before going out to cut. So do your numbers first. Then if that's all comfortable and as a family or a couple or individual, you're comfortable, that's probably number one, then you've got to look at, okay, is there ways I can exploit the market sentiment how it is in my favour? So don't see it as a, as a negative. It's a negative for a lot of people. But if you've done your numbers and you're out there to buy, have a look, how can I actually exploit this market where there's less competition? I'll tell you one thing that's really been noticeable is the off-market channels where in my personal and professional life doing heaps of off-market deals because I'm noticing the agents, the good agents, 
because there's less buyers out there. The good agents are the ones who can piece together off-market deals. The art of the deal, I feel, is coming back with real estate agents where, as we just spoke around, the last 12 to 18 months has been any agent, you know, putting a sign out the front, you know, record price kind of thing. I'm noticing the dialogue with agents is changing as well. They're they're selling the properties again. They're, They're telling me the benefits. They're also piecing together deals. They're finding buyers like who we work with and matching us up with property. So it's it's the art of the deal is is out there for sure. And that, that's coming back slowly. I can feel it. Because off-market deals haven't been popular for a while, Matt, can you give us a little bit of a rundown for those who maybe aren't as familiar with the process and the transaction of, of what an off-market transaction actually looks like from beginning to end? Yeah, for sure. So essentially, I feel there's generally two parts to an off-market. There's through a real estate agent who's representing a seller, or there's direct vendor as well, who uh, obviously they don't pay any fees there end because there's no real estate agent involved. So they're the two parts that we've been doing a lot of off-markets in. Essentially, it's the same as any other process, yet there's no open home, there's no marketing campaign, there's no sign out the front. Uh, generally, minimised buyer pool. Obviously, as a, as a buyer's agent, we get exclusive access to those. So generally, sometimes we're the only ones who know, but generally only a few buyers at any one time will know around these opportunities. And the reasons being of off-market, look, there's plenty because you've got to think about it. There's a story behind every single dwelling. And sometimes the motive isn't just price. Sometimes it's an elderly couple who have uh, need to move elsewhere to in a retirement home to be closer to their family and they need a long settlement so they can take their time or there's unfortunately divorce is a common one um, you know that they couldn't think of anything worse than, than running a four-week campaign with people through death and in, in families is, is one as well where you know it, the the ownership goes into whoever in the family and they're just like look it's a hard time so we want to just get rid of it financial pressure you know, because obviously things like marketing campaigns, agent costs, all those things cost money. So if they can save on them and get the desired result, they can. And just lastly, scenarios where we we did one the other day where the owner was ready to do their next project and they needed, you know, a, an exact settlement date. So we were able to provide that, get it at a better price and, you know, come out with the deal. So to top it all off, one quote, I think, listeners should remember is you have to be creating a win-win environment for everyone involved in the transaction. Buyer, seller, and agent, if there's an agent involved, everyone has to feel like they had a win. So professional buyers know that and you have to create the experience that everyone's had a win. It's a good point to bring up, Matt, because obviously, you know, there is that up emotional upheaval that does often come with with transactions and and as much as we as property investors are trying not to fall into into emotional buying you know it is often just a byproduct anyway you're dealing with people's biggest assets definitely so when we are talking about off markets you know what can people be saying to to get into the know of what's happening with off market deals because it's all well and good to say yeah you should be finding the agents who are you know, wanting to offload things without things being on market or it's all well and good to, you know, buy from an elderly couple. But how do you actually, you know, get to that point? Obviously, yourself being a buyer's agent is probably a good starting point for people. Yeah, well, one tip I can give you, if you want to source off markets as an individual without getting professional help, firstly, get connected with real estate professionals in the areas you're looking at. When I say get connected, ensure they know you're a legitimate buyer And by legitimate, I don't mean you're keen to buy. I mean, you've got your finance in order. You know your brief. You know the location, dwelling type you want, and you're super sharp on what you need. And you're letting the agent know what you need and what you're looking for. And this is what I've got to spend. What have you got coming up? Or, you know, is there anything uh, that you can think of or any pipeline vendors you've spoken to that match this criteria? And then I would follow that up with a call, email, text, on a routine basis. I'm talking every second day. And, you know, that's sometimes what it takes. You've got to treat it like a full-time job because buying property is easy, but buying property well is for the astute buyer. And there's a big difference and it could be hundreds of thousands. So I really feel you've got to treat it like a, like a business, which it should be. You know, uh, one thing I've 
I've learned with the good investors and buyers I work with is they treat it like a business, like their portfolio is a business. So I don't see why you wouldn't treat it that way. So that's my biggest tip. And, and a little tip around just dialogue is, is always around, you know, if you find an opportunity, then start asking the question, you know, if the agent lets you know there's something coming up or, or yeah, we, we're going to take that to option in four weeks. Just say, Mr. and Mrs. Agent, is there any scenario with the, the vendor that I can assist with? Like what suits them settlement wise? And then, you know, they might, if you got that rapport built, they'll tell you. And then you say, cool, if I could facilitate that, is there a price that would get it done today? And it sounds so straightforward, doesn't it? it? It really is. So if you don't ask, you don't know. And I can tell you firsthand, if you know what to say and you ask the right questions, things get done. Because here's my biggest point of all, agents is they're in the listing and selling game. So if they can, if you can get them paid quicker, that's good for them. Definitely. And obviously, you know, we're talking to agents all the time and that, that truly is, while it seems like it's, you know, they want to get the best bang for their buck. It is about, about volumes as opposed to individual sale prices. So definitely some things to be thinking about there, Matt. I know that you've just bought your own property off market. Um, I think it'll be a great case study to be sharing with the audience here what that experience is actually like for yourself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, as I said, I've always practiced what I preach. I, uh, the, when, I, when I heard around the interest rates rising and as soon as the election got put in place, like the date was set and that, I, I went straight to the broker and said, how much can I borrow? Let's go. Because I, I know from past experience, it, things will start to retract. So I'm a big believer in, you know, be, always be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. So I've got all my ducks lined up and an opportunity come up off market in a really tightly held pocket, sub 1% vacancy rate, uh, 100% ownership of the land. It was a, it was a house. Uh, circa 1.2 to 1.25 uh, valuation. I did the val on it and we picked it up for a million and 50. So equity gain. My biggest saying in life is you make your money on the way in with real estate. So I believe you can manufacture equity through negotiation, 100%. And I feel every deal you go into, you should be aiming to make money on the way in because then if you can grab... Uh, you know, a property where it's got a little bit of uplift with cosmetic renovation and you're bought in a good location where the rental yield's quite strong and you can maximise that through a cosmetic reno, you've, you've ticked all these boxes straight away before even settlement date. So that's my biggest tip is remember, you make your money on the way in. So manufacturing equity through negotiation. So yeah, really stoked with that one as a three bed home with uh, option to uh, manufacture equity through reno plus a land bank opportunity in a tightly held pocket in Queensland, yeah. So what's your plan with that property straight off the bat? Will it be to renovate straight away or just get tenants in there and, and start that process of getting your money back? Really good question. Actually, here's a good little tip or, or story going back to what I said. The deal got done so cheap. As I said, I, I feel uh, I'm going to val at, at settlement. Settlement's in, in 60 days. I'll get a val and I feel, you know, there'll be a 200K uplift uh, just from the purchase price. But the reason being is I let the owner stay in there and he's renting it back off me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's what off-market's all about, isn't it? it Helping it, that person out. Exactly right. So I created a situation where I found out what the seller's motive was. He wants to move elsewhere. You know, it's too big for him now. He's only got his dog. Obviously, it's very, he's quite an elderly guy. So it's, it's hard for him to go out there and and look for some. So I didn't want to put any unnecessary pressure on him. So what I did was I offered him a, a really long settlement period, and I also said, "Hey, if you need a hand, I, you can rent it back off me if you like." Got a rental appraisal. I helped him out a little bit on rent, and we've extended that rent to the end of the year with the option: if he wants to move, he can move. If not, you know, at least I'm, I'm providing shelter for someone in the community. So I always say, there's always this things around all these investors and whatnot. But at the end of the day, investors are providing shelter as well for people. You've got to remember that. And those stories don't get mentioned. So um, yeah, but the, the goal long-term is definitely a land bank. I've never sold a property in my portfolio. So this one's definitely going to be a land bank uh, potential to build up and, and capture canal views, uh, which will only maximise the, the value. And, and the basis of the purchase was it was the worst house in the best street. So that's uh, what I tend to focus my purchases on. 
it does sound like a pretty good buy mat. I have to ask how inconvenient then if you're creating that win-win scenario for um, the person that you're you're buying that property from, was there an inconvenience to you or, or in your property investor brain, does it really not matter what sort of happens with that property in the short term, you know, as, as long as it's yours? Exactly. So I've, I've got a long-term hat on. So one thing I see investors do sometimes where they go wrong is they've got a short-term approach. So I feel property is a long game. You don't get rich overnight. You get rich in the long term. So one thing I said, I've done the number, done the negotiation. I knew I was going to make a good wicket on the way in. So I've already got to achieve what you needed to achieve. Yeah. Needed what I needed to achieve from that side, from an equity point of view. So I can pretty much roll at settlement to go again. But on the flip side, it's also providing another piece of shelter for someone who needs shelter. Mm. Another point. And then thirdly, I, I know the area well, I know the rental. So whatever happens, if he leaves early, I literally could rent it out as is condition and still achieve a, a rent that's covering the mortgage and some. So, and then if I wanted to uplift that, obviously could do a paint carpet, fans, quick facade, and then you can uplift your yield that way as well. So I always feel you've got to have a bit of X factor with property, whether that's Cosmetic reno, can you can you uplift the rent? Is it a corner block? Could you uplift it through maybe a DA or potentially a duplex on it one day? Could you build up to maximize views or hinterland views or city view, whatever location it's in? Or is there opportunity where you could just literally land bank it, hold it, and you know that area's got some amenities and infrastructure that's going to push prices up? So always stick to areas I feel that have got that good owner occupier appeal um, and that are set in a really good location because I, I always feel location does 80 percent of the heavy lifting for sure. Some good insight there from you Matt and some some good thoughts for our audience to ponder. We're going to take a quick break there. We'll be back in just a second to hear more about Matt's investment story. It's time to get help. Interest rates are increasing. Inflation has hit an extraordinary 5.1% and the chance to secure a golden egg property is getting narrower by the day. Dragon from Buyers Agency Australia has been presenting the facts and helping property investors make smarter, well-informed, educated decisions in property for years. So what are you waiting for? Get in touch with Dragon today at www.buyersagencyaustralia.com.au. Invest with integrity. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show, joined by the founder and director of the Sarama Group, Matt Sarama. Matt, just before the break, we were talking about your most recent purchase and how it was off market, but it was it your sixth property? Is that where you're at in your own property portfolio? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was six, six property. So I was stuck on five for a good, good while because uh, I started a new company to take my portfolio to the next level. So uh, I'm in that phase now where I'm coming up to two years in business and uh, yeah, we're heating up, that's for sure. So talk us through what, you know, now as having a bird's eye view of six properties, what your journey was like to get to that. I'm sure people have heard it, you know, previously on the Smart Property Investment Show, but just to recap for those that haven't heard it, what was that process like to get to where you are now? Yeah, kind of long story short, obviously I, I played in the NRL as a professional athlete bought two houses when I was playing NRL. Uh, big learning was I should have utilized finance better when I had the opportunity on a, on a good income. Uh, I was young, didn't know that. Uh, luckily, I, I did get two properties whilst playing, but then I retired through injury, unfortunately. So my income went dry pretty much straight away. And I was back on minimum wage. I remember my first gig, I was on about 45k. Then I ended up getting another job at around 55K. And I sat around those salaries for a good three years post uh, rugby league career, chopping and changing work. But one thing I always was committed to was building a portfolio out. What I learned in that phase on the next three properties, I went, went three pretty much back to back. I pretty much went to the ceiling in what I could borrow on minimum wage. I was doing crafty things in, in terms of moving back home and leasing out bedrooms to maximize my yield and servicing. But one thing I learned was 
without income. You could have all the equity in the world, but if you can't service, um, you can't service. The bank, it's a game of finance. Um, it's the bank's rules. So I got to five properties on minimum wage, which I was really proud of. I learned a lot around banks and third tier banks, second tier banks, and how to keep pushing through. But at the end of the day, I couldn't do anything else. And then I read a book called The Cash Flow Quadrant. If no one's read it, it's a really good book by Robert Kiyosaki, the guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that really opened my eyes to starting a business because uh, if you own a business, your income is, you know, there's no ceiling really. So I had no idea what to do. I knew property is my thing. I've become a buyer's agent. Two years now, coming up to two years, I've just been head down, bum up. No portfolio has been put to the side. Business has been put to the forefront. And now, yeah, my, my borrowing's increased a lot. So I bought my sixth one and I'm ready to go. My goal is to get another three to four by the end of the year. Uniblocks is what I'm kind of going to focus on and potentially uh, more more high cash flow because a lot of the five to six purchases that so far, they've all been really good capital growth plays. Talk us through then what that capital growth has looked like. Obviously, we don't have to drill all the way down into Excel spreadsheets, but, you know, we have seen so much growth in the market over the last couple of years. So that's got to have put you in a pretty good position, I'm imagining, especially if you're just holding tight for that time period. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the portfolio sort of sits just under 5 mil at the moment. 4.7 4.7 and the LVRs uh, at around 50%. So to give you perspective, pre-COVID, it was probably sitting around 52% LVR and then post 20, obviously 2021, 20, 20. yeah, the boom time, uh, LVR dropped to like 39%. So it was, uh, it, but I, the hardest thing was I could not pull it out. I could not do anything with all this equity. So my biggest tip is it's a game of finance. Like you really have to be able to service it as well. So that's why I've been working hard in my business to be able to extract all this equity now and and have a play. So uh, this recent purchase, because I bought it so under market, LVR still sits around 50. So uh, yeah, got a bit to play with. And I'm just going to be really selective with the next few purchases because I'm understanding that, uh, yes, cash flow is good, but capital growth is king. Mm. I think it's quite a reassuring sentiment to hear, Matt, that, you know, while we talk all the time on Smart Property Investment Show about how people need to be so dedicated and and focusing on their property portfolio, there are going to come times in life where it can't be the only thing you're actually looking at. And you're a prime example of that, you know, going away and, and doing something else to build yourself up. And I guess investing in yourself which then in turn will help your property portfolio down the track, even if the last two years haven't necessarily felt like that's where your focus has been. Yeah, definitely. I'm, it's a really good point, Grace. I think uh, I chat to guys, especially younger guys, because I, I still consider myself young. I'm, I'm 30, 31, but uh, I chat to guys in their 20s and whatnot and they're frustrated. You know, they might have one property or like I, I, I just can't fathom how much time there is in life really. Like, it's a patience game and I really feel firstly stay in your own lane you know it's really hard obviously I'm a really avid property investor I love to keep going I'm a guy who needs to be on to the next thing and I love the the process and the journey so for me for two years of basically not being able to do a thing and you know seeing all these other people buying property and, and during those markets it's really disheartening but at the end of the day like you got to focus on yourself. It is what it is. So utilize, you're right, utilize those times or periods where you might not be able to purchase. Or another big tip is sometimes you might have a purchase price ceiling for what you're earning, right? And that can only get you a certain amount of property. Sometimes it's better to go away, be patient, don't rush into it and say, hey, how can I actually level up my income as a as an individual as, asset? So mm. you as an asset, what are you doing to improve yourself? So are you, are you reading, listening, learning? Are you growing a business? Are you you've got a side gig? So there's plenty of ways that you can boost yourself in times of to boost your income because uh, that's what I really believe is obviously the more you got to play with, the better their asset choices as well. So it's all one big merry-go-round, isn't it? And then the more property you own, the more, I guess, passive income you have, which allows you to, more time to to 
dedicate to your passion projects you have in life you know at the end of the day it's not about the money it's around the the choice and the freedom that it allows you you know and and being able to have a purpose i see a lot of people who just keep buying property for for no reason as well you know so you gotta like where is the ceiling what is your your purpose and drive in life and and work backwards from that so speaking of what's your purpose or drive when it comes to building that portfolio and, and where you hope it will take you in the future? Yeah, for me, it's all around impact for me. I, I really always reflect on it. I'm a very reflective person. I think impact through a gift I've been given, you know, into this world around property. Like I've always been the guy people go to in my when I was a kid and even in high school, like people, everyone knew I loved property. And now as a professional, I get to actually help people and get paid for it. So I feel I've been blessed on this earth to, I've been given a gift, you know, and a skill set. So I've got to be able to provide that to people. And then really I'm, I'm, I'm big on freeing up my time to do things I, I love, you know, whether that is buying property for people. I'm a family person, you know, and I've got family in Brisbane and, and you know, the more income I can make, I, I outsource things in my life. You know, I, I outsource a, a chef, I outsource um, you know, people to clean my house. I outsource all these things because it allows me more free time on a Sunday to hang out with my friends and family. So I think it's the simple things in life. What I've noticed is when you free up more time, you get to dedicate it to more things that bring you joy and impact to others. So whether the impacts to your family or we've all got a skill set, I think we need to impact the world as well. So, um, and as a property investor, because I know you, a lot of property investors listen, don't don't see yourself as a net because sometimes people disregard property investors. I think you're providing shelter as well. So I think it's a great thing in life that property can give you. Awesome, Matt. And in the future, I talked about those unit purchases being something that you're looking to do by the end of the year. Do you have any, you know, ideas or forecasts? Obviously, none of us have a crystal ball or we'd all be doing pretty well in life, but where do you expect the market to go for the next couple of years? Yeah, look, yeah, you're right. No one knows. But one thing I do know is uh, definitely for the short term future, I feel due to interest rates, all those sorts of things, 12 to 18 months ago, rapid rise probably won't be there. So it's a time where you can really build out a good foundational portfolio, some good deals. I think I always believe if there's a deal, there's a deal, regardless what the market's doing. So try and identify like quantify value on what a property is worth in the areas you're looking at. At least that way, if something comes up or you're chatting to agents off market and they're presenting something and you know what you can negotiate with, you know what a deal price could be. So in terms of areas, I really want to stick to as close to capital cities as I can. I'd love to diversify out of Queensland. I have been looking a little bit in the, in the Perth and Adelaide and, and places like that, but ideally looking for as much land ownership, so 100% land ownership, but being able to get some growth out of that land, whether it was medium to high density zoning, uh, but also offsetting the mortgage with uh, maybe dual income where there's two duplexes on it or three or four, you know, uh, kind of thing. So obviously chat to your broker around um, different lending structures for commercial lending if it goes over three and above. But yeah, stuff like that. That's what I'm really looking for. A bit of bit of cash flow, but still looking in those key driving areas. Well, best of luck with it all, Matt. I can't wait to see where it takes you. No doubt we'll have you on the show again soon to for you to update us all about it. But keep on doing what you're doing and and keep killing it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. Having us again, Grace, and, and shout out to the SPI team. It's always great to get invited and chat here. And um, yeah, if, if any advice to any of the property investors out there, what I'm noticing, the top 1%, they're gearing up now. So don't listen to the 99%. Get educated. Be safe. Don't go to your eyeballs and debt. Be safe. But just remember, the top 1%, you've got to be doing what 99% of people aren't doing. You heard it here first, Matt. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Grace. To everyone who is listening along, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions, reach out, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. As always, stay up to date with the latest news on our website. Subscribe if you haven't already and stay up to date with us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. That is all we have time for today. But until next episode, stay safe and well wherever you're listening from. 
Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. It's safe to say the property market has been red hot over the last few years, with some of the markets we've selected in 2021 rising over 40% in a 12-month period. It's very likely that if you're a property owner, your property has gone up 20% minimum in value in the past 12 months, and you have most likely accrued sizable equity that can be recycled and extracted to build your investment portfolio. With interest rates increasing, You might be wondering where to invest to maximise capital growth and cash flow in 2022 and beyond. Well, to save you time, energy and guesswork, award-winning author and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment podcast, Paul Glossop and his team at Pure Property Investment have outlined the top 30 affordable suburbs poised for strong capital growth over the next few years with sound cash flow. Grab your free Top 30 Guide to Property Investment Guide today at purepropertyinvestment.com.